So as you see, we very much share this positive vision of Hilmar. Hello, FanFest. Thanks a lot for having us here. It's great to be back in Reykjavik after this rather lengthy COVID break. It has been a long time, but we were not idling through these years. So much so that in 2020, we introduced the third iteration of Project Discovery inside EVE, and as you will see, with quite amazing results. Today, I'm here with two of my fellow partners in crime, with Jerome Valdispul from McGill University and Ryan Brinkman from Dotmatics slash University of British Columbia. And these great brains will bring the real scientific beef to our talk today, so I try to be rather short, but I have some really interesting news that I must share with you. So, some of you might know me. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a small Swiss company that we named Massively Multiplayer Online Science, or MMOS. We're the ones who kind of seduced CCP on this crazy adventure, which became a very successful and long-term collaboration in the field of citizen science. And the idea was to use this amazing force of collective human cognitive capabilities that you guys, the EVE community, provides to advance science. Now, I'm also an adjunct at McGill University, and also I may be an honorary EVE dev. I mean, I have an EVE dev shirt, which I uh, really appreciate, but I think the real Latmus test will be whether I get a, a Viking sword from Hilmar for the 10th year. So, well, that's to be seen. So, Project Discovery, it was really a hell of a nine years. Actually, this story started in 2014 with a call to Andy Norgren, CCP Seagull, and that call started a series of events that led up to what we know today as Project Discovery. It was not obvious, it was not without risk or challenges to pull off such an unprecedented collaboration. But really, with the amazing help of the teams at CCP and with your continuous support, which was started right from the beginning, right in 2015, when we introduced our first vague ideas about this com concept at FanFest, all this bore fruit, and in 2016, we finally released Project Discovery. The first iteration was a collaboration with the Human Protein Atlas, a team led by Emma Lundberg. And uh, we asked players to classify, to improve the labeling on a massive data set that they have of these beautiful immunofluorescent microscopy images of human cells. This is a data set that is used by tens of thousands of researchers worldwide. Now, this project already broke records. So I think you might remember that the ultimate reward for Project Discovery was the Sisters of Eve combat suit, which was supposed to be handed out some, in some three or four weeks after launch. The first one was unlocked 17 hours in 17 hours, and the second one six minutes later. So yeah, the Eve community proved to be quite something. Now, in 2017, we switched to hunting for exoplanets, and we had the pleasure and honor to have uh, Nobel laureate Professor Michel Mayer on the project from the University of Geneva. He is the one who discovered the first exoplanet, and um, I vividly remember that after his talk, his, uh, Professor Mayer's talk at FanFest, Berger, CCP Berger, came to me and said that he out-nerded EVE players, which sounded like the ultimate EVE compliment. <laughs> and in 2020, we jumped on a new project in a time of urgency and need. Uh, this was to help improve our scientific tool set in immunology that can help COVID research and so much more in the future. Now, this was a milestone project, which, because we managed to show that with everything in place, we can act as a rapid action force. And just to give you an idea, from the, from the time that Berger sent me an email about, you know, is there anything that we can help, to the time when we launched the project, it took only six weeks. That's quite remarkable. 
And I mentioned too that you will hear about what uh, you, your work collectively, collectively has amounted to uh, soon. And believe me, it's nothing short of groundbreaking. So this is where we are now. Everybody is happily clustering blood data in EVE. But before I pass on the mic, I want to talk a bit about the future. Uh, sorry, I couldn't resist, so this might be the only time. <laughs> One more thing. So there is a thing that came up consistently during all these years from you guys and from other gamer communities as well. And it seems that in 2024, finally, we'll be able to respond to this re re request. In 2024, we're launching a new mobile platform, a new mobile citizen science platform, uh, the Play Science iOS and Android app, and its supporting API that will substantially increase our capabilities to serve the scientific community with this tool set that we're building for almost 10 years now. Now, for you primarily, what it means is that when you're not in front of EVE at your PCs, you're on the go. You can still play with your favorite EVE minigame, Project Discovery. And you can help analyze scientific data. You can collect points. And with all these points, you can get back to EVE and reclaim your rewards. Sort of like a Project Discovery companion app, if you will. But it's more than that. We have not, we'll have not only Project Discovery on this platform, but it will act as a host of, for different citizen science minigames. Some of these will be co-created with our partners in the game industry. Some of them will be just plain old citizen science app. These games will vastly improve our capabilities to, to open up this platform for other research initiatives. And what's important for you is that regardless of which project you contribute to, you get the same achievements, same points, and the same sweet rewards inside EVE. Now, with all this, we really hope that this will become sort of a platform for like-minded players, players for whom doing good by playing is not an oxymoron. And the reason why I believe in this is that, well, partly because these last years, I think I talked to over 100, 100 of game developers. None of them discarded this idea. On the contrary, everybody was super inspired. The real reality is that the fact that we pulled this off, Project Discovery, it's CCP, or Borderlands Science with Gearbox, is almost a miracle. Game developers are super swamped. And I guess you know better than me this endless things you want to see in the game to be fixed, to be introduced, to be changed, uh, an endless wish list that you curate for EVE devs. So with all the dedication that CCP have for this project, there is only 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So with this step, we believe that we can relieve a lot of pressure on the game devs in-house. And again, we can make it much more accessible for other games and other gamer communities to join forces with us and be part of this story. And finally, we at MMOS will do our best to steer this app in a good direction and to do all the development and to serve as many research projects as possible. But one thing we want to avoid is to, for us becoming a bottleneck in this process. So what we'll do is we'll take this API that we're developing and we'll open this up for partnering research institutions. So, and this is the grand vision that in the future, you might be playing with some of the well-known citizen science projects out there, and you're still contributing to the same achievements and points and EVE rewards. And this is not just wishful thinking. I've been talking to many of the major citizen science projects out there, and everybody is super excited about this possibility. So 
This is what we're planning, and I believe if we're doing a good job, we'll probably write citizen science history again together. So I hope you're excited, as, as excited as we are. There is one caveat that, uh, that I have to say is that, um, of course, at this point, nothing is carved in stone. There's a lot of things to sort out. So things might and can change in the following months as we progress with this project. Also, look out for the EVE newsletter, because we'll send out a link to sign up for beta testing in the coming month. And finally, I cannot stress enough that without your support, continuous support, enthusiasm and encouragement, project discovery would not exist. So a huge thank you for all of you who became a citizen scientist through EVE Online. Thank you, and please welcome Jérôme Valdispul. Hello, so my name is Jérôme Valdispul. I'm a professor of computer science at McGill University. I'm working in bioinformatics and human-computer interactions. Part of my research is to blend together computer and human brain to solve the most fundamental and pressing scientific challenges. So you may want to ask, why do we need a uh, human brain at the age of computers and AI? And I try to partially answer your question here. So in science, we try to solve fundamental problems like protein folding, fi finding patterns into DNA. You never have access to the ground truth. You can only measure some different parameters that potentially can estimate the quality of the answer you're providing. The problem here is like these parameters are not comparable directly. So the best you can do is to compute a set of solutions that are all optimizing uh, these parameters. And that's what we call the Pareto front. So if you look at this a graph here, you can measure one parameter, you have the size or the density, and what you try to compute is this green line here. The problem is that the parameters we're estimating are not perfect. So in truth, what you want to compute is the region near this part of front, the solution are near optimal. And this, arguably, computer can do it very well. But this is where things start to be complicated. Because eventually, in this set of solutions, we want to find the true solutions. And how do we do that? We do that by calling out to scientists. So scientists sit, look at different solutions and different parameters, and all agreeing together about where the ground truth should be. And what it generates is something that computer cannot do. It generates trust. The problem we have is science we have massive amount of data, ridiculous amount of data. So it's not possible for a small research team to go for this data, even if we know it's fundamental, it's essential for good research. And this is where citizen science aims to solve the problem. The principle of citizen science is to gather a lot of people that will look at the data, and then we rely on the human pattern recognition skills to identify the most promising solutions, and the agreement generated by, by the citizen scientists will, generate the ground, will identify the ground truth solutions that experts usually find. And then suddenly, we can generate trust again for massive amount of data. One problem that is fascinating me, that is ubiquitous in science, is clustering. In its more abstract form, it's about finding patterns within a distribution of data. And identifying these patterns is not simple. It cannot be embedded into a single mathematical function. Often, sometimes you want to identify something that is done, sometimes that answers the rules of continuity. There's many different parameters. And the only way to really robustly identify the solution is to do it by having many people, humans, agreeing together where the solution is. So we had work doing on that in my lab for, for a large time, uh, for, for solving the clustering problem and, and creating robust solution involving crowdsourcing. But we had one major issue, engagement. 
we never managed to have enough people sitting here on the table looking at the same data and agreeing together. So how do we solve that? This is where project discovery enters. In 2016, when I heard for the first time about project discovery, I was amazed. For the first time in my life, I understood that something can change science. For the first time in my life, I understood there was thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that could be here uh, looking at the same data and solve this, this problem. And most importantly, what convinced me it was the key for that is the enthusiasm generated by the community in general. So I gave a call to Attila and said, I'm a fan, your project can change science. Uh, I just want to hear more about it. And eventually we discussed and we became friends. And then the COVID pandemic enters. 2020, uh, Attila calls me and tells me, well, we have an issue. Yes, I know. Uh, and I'm in touch with uh, CCP, and CCP wants to help. They want to do something. Uh, we have a fantastic tool, Project Discovery, that, that already achieved uh, scientific milestones. But they want to help, and they want to make something uh, fantastic. Do you have an ID? Yeah, I do have an ID. I know a problem that can make a difference in biomedical research. We know that it works, and most importantly, I know an expert of the field that can help us to make it real. And this is where Ryan Brinkman's under. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a scientist. I'm also a gamer, a pretty hardcore gamer. I beat Eve about three years ago by not playing. Um, it scares the crap out of me. Because um, I'm a data scientist, and um, I, I like my life. Um, so I do full geometry bioinformatics, informatics. And as part of that, I go around the world. I've given hundreds of talks in front of scientists, and I go up here and tell them the cool shit I've done. And at the end of it, they applaud, um, and I feel good. Um, and, and Ewan, this is for you if you're listening. In Soviet Russia, I'm here as the presenter telling you about the cool stuff that you've done, and I just want to applaud you. For, for the last thousand days, thousands of you have been playing Project Discovery. You've analyzed millions of plots, and the data that you're generating is going to change the world. It's going to help us find cures for cancer. It's going to help us find cures for all kinds of diseases. And it couldn't have happened without the people in this audience who played Project Discovery. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and not just from me. All the data that has been submitted is going to be released for any use whatsoever by other scientists around the world. And they know this is coming, and they are so very excited. It's incredible. Um, the, the reason why this is so important is because the data you're analyzing is going to help us understand the immune system. So right now, as you're sitting there, your bone marrow is pumping out stem cells. These, are the, these white blood cells differentiate into many, many different types of cells. We can understand the functions of these cells by looking at the proteins on the cell surface. And um, these, these proteins on the cell surface tell us what these cells are doing right now in your blood. There's some cells in your blood called T cells. And these are the, one, these are the cells in your blood that help us, or when, if you've gotten COVID before, um, we, or help mount your immune response to the disease. There's other cells in your body that can be re-engineered to cure cancer. There's a, uh, and in 2018, there was a Nobel Prize given out for the discovery of CAR-T therapies. There's now six FDA drugs approved that can cure cancer. We're not going to find a single cure for cancer, but CAR-T therapy is probably the brightest thing that's ever happened in, in the history of understanding this disease. There's other cells in your body that can detect bacteria that have come into your, into your system and target them so other cells called natural killer cells can find them and attack them and get rid of them. If we didn't have a functioning immune system, we'd all either be living in bubbles or be dead. And flow cytometry is a technology that helps us understand this. So how this technology works is we come up to somebody, sneak up on them, stab them, take their blood, and then what we do is we label proteins on the cell surface with antibodies that are conjugated to 
fluorochromes, such that when these cells pass one by one past a laser in a flow cytometer, they glow. And the amount of light that these cells give off is proportional to the amount of protein they have on that cell surface that we've labeled them with. And we label them with all kinds of different uh, fluorescently conjugated antibodies so we can see what's there. So if you played Project Discovery, you've seen plots that are shown here, like on the right hand side of the screen. So the cells on the very right have 10, 100, 1,000 times more of that protein on the cell surface. And because of that, we can infer the function of those cells, while the cells on the left have 10, 100, 1,000 times less. And then by drawing the boxes around these gates that the scientists are doing right now all over the world and enumerating how many sit in that box, we can infer you know, if, how that much that percentage changes from sick versus healthy, treated versus untreated. And this is how we understand how the immune system works. Flow cytometry is the only technology that allows us to do this in the proper way. It sucks. It sucks for lots of reasons. The analysis part sucks. Um, it's very complex. We're looking at 40-dimensional data on a two-dimensional screen. And the scientists have to try to figure out the right pathways to go through that data and find all those cell populations. It's time-consuming to analyze one sample from a patient. Now, there's many plots they have to look at that, uh, to make that analysis, not just a single one. It could take 30 minutes to two and a half hours that a scientist is looking at that plot to understand, for example, if that patient has minimal residual disease and going to die of cancer. We're making diagnosis life and death decisions based on flow cytometry data analysis, and it's so important. It's not cheap to pay these people, doctors and scientists, not me, but get a lot of money to do their work. Or, or you can outsource it to another country and wait three months to get the answer back, and that sucks. And between scientists, it's, it's a challenging thing. If you play the game, you know, where exactly do, these, do we want to put those gates? And even professional scientists, people who do this for a living, have trouble. And they can get about a 32% difference in, between two scientists. And there's just so much data out there that there's no way they can possibly look through it all. So obviously, if you've been awake for the last three years, um, AI, machine learning, is the way to go to solve this problem. So all we have to do to do that is go out and get the data that the scientists have analyzed and then use that to train an algorithm, because you need data to train machine learning. It's in the name, right? Machine learning. Well, the problem is scientists don't share their data of how they've analyzed that. And there's lots of reasons for that, and we won't go into it in the, today's talk, but there's no way we can get the amount of data you need to train machine learning algorithms to make this possible. That's where Project Discovery is cha Oh, wait, I didn't have this, but it's a good one. This is where Project Discovery changed the game. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so, um, but you, as smart as all of you are, and there's some really, really smart people that play EVE Online, I get that. But there's no way that we could teach all of you the biology that the scientists have in their head for how to trace through these patterns of data and the reasons why they're gating certain populations. The, it just, there's just too much information in there to do. But um, it's kind of like Shakespeare, and not that you guys are monkeys, but with enough of you, we can write Shakespeare. <laughs> and that the hypothesis that we had at the, at the beginning of this whole story when COVID came out is that you, if I give you guys plots like this, you can probably figure out what the things are without actually understanding anything about the biology. And pff, you guys did it. It's incredible. And, and not only is that, I just have to thank the CCP people who are here who are at the very, very start of COVID in the space of a few weeks re-engineered the same kind of technology and the same kinds of plots that professionals who do this for a living do within EVE Online. And it, it looks just like this. And the hope was that if I give you guys some pictures that look like this and say, can you draw circles around the important bits? You would and you do again and again and again, 24 hours a day, tens of thousands of you are doing this. And you're doing a really fantastic freaking job and please don't stop. Six, at the lowest level in this plot is 6.5 million plots per month. It's incredible. It's amazing. And when it was so much data that we had to write new algorithms, you guys are just going through it so fast, we had to figure out better ways to give you data. So we had to invent new algorithms. And I'm sorry for those of you who are playing this right at the beginning of COVID. You probably saw a lot of the plots that looked the same. 
uh, because we didn't have a way to find heterogeneous plots so you would see things that were different. So because of this, we had to invent whole new ways to figure out how to show you data so you could give us data. And so we just published a paper on this. And hopefully, if you've been playing the game recently, you've started to see more patterns in the data. And that's really important for us to be able to chain, train machine learning algorithms because it's that variety that's going to allow us to do more and more with that. So for those of you who played a game, that now my, my chance to tell you something that, some things that we've learned that maybe can up, up your game, is what, what I'm showing here is the same plot that's been analyzed by five different people. And you, you have to apologize where you see those lines overlapping. That's not really the way it is. It's just when you have 400 million plots, you can't do things perfectly. It's just we don't have enough compute time, so we had to make some, we had to make some shortcuts in how we drill those boundaries. Just assume th those aren't overlapping. So you can see on the left-hand plot, somebody drew two, then somebody else drew three, and four, and five, and six. These aren't the droids you're looking for. Um, here's another plot. Um, same kind of thing. Somebody's drawn three, and then somebody else drew four, five, six, seven gates around the data. This is also not really what you're looking for. Some of you people are fucking amazing. This, and I've shown, I've given talk, like I said, I've given talks all over the world on this, and I show scientists what you guys have done. This, I, I'm not making this up, is better than expert scientists do. There's lots of reasons for that. The main one is they're so focused on the biology and the parts that are interesting, they ignore everything else. And that's sad, because there's, uh, there's many things we can do with flow cytometry data. We can make diagnosis on patients. And in order to make that diagnosis, we have to find specific cell populations and see how much those have changed. And the reason why we look at those specific populations is because some professor and their grad student and their grad student and their grad student for tens of tens and tens of years have studied specific cell populations. I've understood those are important. There's lots of information in this data. There's so much information that they can't look through it all. But because of the way you are analyzing this, you're putting boxes around all the things. And from that, not only can we do diagnosis of patients, we can do discovery of new things. And that's the way we're going to not only find new drugs, but also to make sure that drugs that, you, that people are going to get are safer. So they're not just targeting the things that we know about, but there's nothing that, that we call off-target effects, where the new drug that we give you hits something in your immune system that we never knew to look at, but then you're going to end up growing a new toe or something, and that's going to make you sad. <laughs> so what, what you see here, for example, this, this person, this is where I shine the laser in somebody else's eye. You can s I don't know where it's... It's the laser. Doesn't really work. You can see the person on the very bottom right. What they've done is they've drawn a, a, a gate around every feature. So you have to remember that the, the order on these axes is a log order. So the cells on the left are, have tens of thousands of amount more of that protein than the cells on the other side that I said, left versus right. So because it's so much more protein on that, we're inferring those cells have a different function. There's no truth in this. There is no right answer. There is no way that these cells can say, hey, this is the function I have until you sort them out in a tube and do some kinds of experiments on them. But you can't do that until you put the box around them so you can put them into a well and do experiments. And so this is amazing. And lots of you are doing this. And we, I don't know how you knew to do this, because we didn't really tell you. And one thing that we're, that we're hoping to do is start giving better instructions to allow you to do this. But enough of you are doing this, <laughs> it's amazing. So not only just one or two or three people are giving us the right answers. What we're doing is we, we're, enough of you are doing this. So we might get 15 or more people that are doing the really kind of perfect gates that we want. And then what we can do is we can make a consensus out of all those people to get closer to the truth than any one of you guys can do by, your, by yourself. And that's this the consensus of multiple gamers that we're using in part to train machine learning algorithms. So not only are there fan fests for gamers who play EVE, there's fan fests for scientists. We call them conferences. And... Um, we go there and I, I, we go there and give talks about science, and I get on stage and say, hey, we're doing some cool stuff, and look what I've invented. Two years ago, we played Eve Online in Philadelphia, and we set it up in a booth, and we had professional flow cytometry people. There is about as many of them there as there are people here. And we had them play, so you can see them, they're playing the same game you guys played. And so we did something. We we compared the professional scientists against the gamers. 
Now, we, we kind of gamify the game that they were playing. They only had a minute and 30 seconds to do as many plots as they could, so you guys can stare at it as long as you want. If we allowed the scientists to do that, they would still be there today because they want to get things exactly right. It's not an exact comparison, but the punchline is the statistics, the p-value that we got on that results of you versus the scientist, you see where this is going? You did better, statistically better. And I, I got this, shivers, shivers. I have, I have shivers right now. It's amazing because that gave us the confidence that the data you're doing is going to allow us, allow us, scientists, me and others who are going to use this data to do amazing things. So that's the data that we're using to train the machine learning algorithms. And this is, this is great. This is really simplified, break it down data that we can just feed thousands and thousands and millions of plots and train machine learning algorithms. And we've done it. We have two proof-of-concept machine learning algorithms that we developed using completely different machine learning approaches that can identify every feature into editable polygons the same way that they were done it by hand, down all possible hierarchies. And I, like I said, this is going to enable two things. It's going to enable diagnosis of patients, we hope, if it gets good enough, at least in a very broad sense. More importantly, it's going to enable discovery at scale in a way that is simply not possible with the technologies and the software that we have available today. And we can put this into software so that somebody can click a button and gates appear that fast. And that's trained exactly on data that came out of you guys. They can get the gates that fast. Remember how fast? It, so there might be 20 or so plots that they, they have to go through. We can generate ones that quick. It's a game changer. I've showed this to exec, um, senior level management at pharmaceutical companies, and they cannot wait to get their hands on this software because, again, this is going to allow them to look at off-target effects in drugs and get drugs faster and cheaper that cure so many diseases of the immune system. So this is the result that we can get out of machine learning algorithms trained on project discovery data. I have shown this to scientists. Again, they can't believe how good this is. It's amazing. Now, is it always that good? So th this is one other example of how the machine learning algorithms can pump out of data. And it looks pretty good. I'm really happy with this result. But it's actually one of the worst performing result scores that we had. It's important that we show the bad data. So the F1 score that I'm showing here, you guys love math maybe, it's a harmonized mean of sensitivity and specificity. You can kind of figure it out as a percentage. It's not a very good mark, <laughs> 57. You kind of want it to be like one. Uh, or 0.57, you want it to be one. So why is it so bad? Because scientists can't make up their minds of what they want. So the challenge here, and what, you show, what I'm showing on the left-hand side of the screen is the gold standard, and the right-hand side is the result of machine learning algorithm that was based on project discovery. And what's shown in red is where the difference is between the truth and what the algorithm came up with. And so the challenge here is humans are doing two different kinds of things at the same time. The humans. <laughs> um, in, at the bottom of the plot, where there's that, that smear, smears are really hard, where there's no definable information about where something ends and something else begins. And so on the bottom of that plot, the, the scientists, or what, what, we, what they believe they want, is different than what's shown on the left-hand column, because on the, on the bottom, they've kind of drawn the line between the populations on the left and the right. And on the left-hand column, they said that smear in the middle goes into its own population. And so in the same kind of context, based on biology, based on their understanding of the disease, which is something you guys don't have a handle on, but because this is CD14 versus CD16, we have to make different choices about what to do with those different bits. They're making different choices about how to separate that stuff out. You guys can never do that. But um, what, we're, what we're learning from this process is what we can do is have the scientists give us a template. Just give us one sample that you've done the analysis on, and we'll use that to drive the machine learning approach to their version of truth. And, and that seems that that's going to work for us in cases where we make, um, they want to make more refined decisions. And that, that's going to still help us a lot. Because then they don't have to gate 300 samples, they might only have to gate two or three. 
And they'll, they'll have to do a few because not every person who's sick is, looks the same in the same way in their immune system. And so they might have to get one healthy person, one sick person, and maybe one person with three heads. And then we can use those templates and match them with the sample that we're trying to analyze and say, which of these templates that they've analyzed do we want to use on top of the machine learning driven approach that has been coming, that's come out of project discovery. And that looks like it's going to work really, really, really well. Not only are we going to help do the analysis of the, of the data to find those cell populations, because you guys are so awesome, that's given us the idea that we can do more. So the other problem that scientists have is once they identify those cell populations, we have to talk about them. We have to have names that we can converse in, which is why we have things like T cells and B cells and natural killer cells that we can say, oh, that natural killer cell population is 22%. So we have to have these labels on these cells. Well, it turns out that's also not standardized. When the, when the, when the scientists talk about them, they don't have some, they have some words, but people aren't using them in a reproducible or even computational way so we could do massive analysis. So we can find everything, but what did we actually find? So the next stage that we're doing is not only are we gonna do this breadth of data that you've been doing so far, is we're gonna go down specific pathways of data that, for example, in the diagnosis of cancer or a diagnosis of some other disease of the immune system, we're gonna go deep down these paths and you guys are gonna analyze the data and because you have a full view of the data and you can put boxes around all these dots, that's gonna allow us to make maps, computational maps. And those computational maps, again, we're gonna give out to everybody and I, and I talk to a whole, I, basically every software company that does this we're all gonna work off the same map that's gonna come out of the data that you guys are providing, and we're gonna put the labels on there through a, um, as a second step that we can get from literature, and we're gonna get all the scientists in the room to agree on those labels, and that way everybody in the world is gonna be coming off the same map and using the same words, and that way we can compute on data in a way that we just can't to do today in any way. Very large, big data analysis. It's gonna be amazing. And you have to understand, this is going to completely change the workflows that in one company alone at BMS, there's 800 people who do nothing but analyze flow cytometry data. That's just one big pharmaceutical company. That's not taking apart all the other pharma, all the big pharma companies. That's not including all the, you know, thousands of people in all the academic labs. That's just in one site. And so what has to happen is many, many different kinds of things. And through the work that has been done through Project Discovery, we're gonna change that workflow and automate that, such that um, once the data comes off the machine, we can suck that up into the cloud. We can use the ML gating that's come off Project Discovery to gate all, everything that's in there. We can put labels on those populations. And then there's other stuff we can do that's not really tied to Project Discovery, but it is enabled because of this technology coming online, such as we can do all the statistics that people want to do, and then we can pull out the things that are different. For example, this green, this green line is a patient who's had a very different reaction to a drug than everybody else. This is how science works. This is how discoveries are made. This is how we prevent people from dying from drugs that we give them when we didn't know that there's some kind of effect because we just haven't looked at enough data. This is gonna fundamentally change how science is being done because it allows scientists to do science rather than all the gating that you guys are doing right now. And that not only can we do that against the data that people are generating today, once we have those tools in place, we can go back and apply them to all the data that these pharmaceutical companies have in their databases. It's just sitting there, they collect it, they don't throw all this out, but they can't do anything with it because it's not been analyzed in a harmonized way. So we can scale this technology across all their past and future data, and we can put this in a standardized platform, and this digitization of data is going to fundamentally change how discovery is done. It's going to fundamentally change an in the investment that anybody has done on data, so we can return that, and this is the RRI, the return on investment of that those discovery dollars, with nothing extra effort, because it's all automated. And the beauty of this is that if somebody somewhere discovers this new cell population that, I don't know, toe fungus or something, right? And it, we, we found something that nobody's ever looked at before. Great, it cures toe fungus. Um, 
what else does it do? And because of this automation and standardization of the pipelines and the analysis and the way we can now push all this data through and have it all sitting there waiting, as soon as somebody finds something, we can automatically see, well, what else has this been seen in that we haven't looked at it before because we didn't know to look there? That's crazy cool. So, it's because of you guys that this happened. There's so many people that have contributed. 20,000 people did the really, really, really good job. Is Basil here? Maybe? No? What we did is, we've ranked everybody from 1 to 20,000 who's given us data for project discovery that ended up in the really good consensus. Go to tinyurl.com slash project discovery. See if your name is there. Email me. And if you happen to be the top ranked person who's here at FanFest, swag. <laughs> that would be awesome. And really, all of you, even if you're not Basil or Zrina or Aber, Rend, Oren, or the Vipes, from me, from behalf of the community, thank you again so very much. I also want to thank CCP for making this happen, um, especially David and Julia, if you guys are here. Um, really, the, the love that they have for this project discovery that allowed this to happen couldn't have happened without them, couldn't have happened without you. 710,000 different players, accounts, and counting. Lots of people who have been involved. Many, many scientists are, are interested in this data. Many scientists have been um, working to get this done. I have to thank our funders. And now, again, thank you all so very much. <laughs>